Okay, great. So we've already heard in our uh, earlier technology sessions, both this morning and yesterday, uh, enough buzz about SaaS and the role that SaaS has not only in today's market but in the future market. And the truth is, you know, it, it really is uh, making a lot of noise and uh, it causes us as in our engagements with the client to really ask, is HR ready for SaaS and are they able to make the buy in SaaS? Um, you know, is all of this buzz and noise really leading to anything uh, in the form of actionable uh, activity? And really what's driving a lot of that is, uh, is a whole lot of activity around acquiring in the market. So in 2011, 2012, we had a lot of folks that were pairing up and merging. Some of those that were more impactful include our big ERP providers um, choosing their SaaS mates and trying to figure out what their future going forward would be from that. Um, others like Aon and Deloitte acquiring Aggressor, um, trying to pick their workday uh, integration horses um, for the market. The products themselves are building out, and while Workday is adding and trying to get fill uh, the modules that it's missing or doesn't have today, um, our ERP brethren are trying to figure out how to retrofit SaaS talent with core HR in an ERP module. And so there's a lot of development activity, along with some aspiring folks who are developing their own SaaS platforms. Northgate Orenso has had a Eureka in the market for a while. And we see a lot of regional and smaller players developing and, and trying to bring very quickly SaaS to market. Uh, on top of the technology noise, then we have the outsource market noise. And so many of our buyers really aren't interested in technology only. They've had a services and technology model for a while. Um, they're interested in maintaining that single point of administration and contact. And so we have providers that are steadfast HRO providers who are racing to choose their partners and implement solutions on top of Workday. So we see Ann Hewitt having done this already with uh, Motorola and a handful of other clients. IBM and Northgate Orinso, not far behind, looking to stand up um, some HRO models that pair SaaS as the technology solution. We see um, success factors uh, a little bit further behind, but um, also kind of grabbing its token or its client, um, clients, uh, headline clients, and then still this buzz of, of, um, of HRO SaaS provider models that is happening um, on the sideline. So um, in the last year, year and a half, um, we've been involved uh, in a number of client engagements. These are HR buyers that are looking for technology, they're looking for services, or they're looking for some combination, what we would have always termed HRO in the market. And it's occurred to me that while everyone is talking about and interested in trying to plot their future forward into the, into the SaaS arena and figure out what that roadmap looks like, that, um, that, that everyone manages to find a, a, an experience or a couple of experiences. And in the last 18 months, we've touched 25 live client activities who are seeking technology services or both. And uh, that's about 23 more than most individual clients can kind of point to and come up with and, and gain some lessons learned from. So I've taken the noise and the activity and the results of those uh, two years worth of touch points and kind of cultivated through them and, and pulled together some observations to share with you today around what actually is happening in the HR buyer market. Um, we do see a lot of noise and activity and buzz and, and quite truthfully, one of the reasons that that's so loud I think is because we have software firms now, whether it's Workday or SuccessFactors, uh, SaaS, who are taking their ground up approach and generating through sales activity, armies of sales activity and leads um, a lot of interest and a lot of noise, and some of that's bubbling up while uh, other um, activity is bubbling down from the tops. And, uh, and so we do see just a, a heightened level of interest, a lot of seeking, a lot of RFIs, a lot of searches happening out there. We also see the SaaS suppliers, when they're talking about their SaaS footprints, putting forth a, a number of logos, um, a number of examples of where they have client base, but truthfully, this um, the apples to apples comparison is missing many times. So when you see an Employee Central or an SAP um, logo set, um, it's very difficult to know whether that's their talent success factors clients or whether they're really looking at the core HR piece that you might be looking at. And so trying to sort through that and sift through that noise and really make sure that you understand who's done what in the space that you're interested in has been extremely challenging for HR buyers. Um, uh, so what, what I'll present is I just kind of cultivated some of the results that I want to share with you today 
and I'll present, um, first of all, some of the, the high-level questions, right? So there's an awful lot of stuff going on there, an awful lot of people looking for things. Um, and so it caused us to ask some questions about who's doing what and who's shopping for what in the marketplace. And the first thing I looked at was whether these are new buyers or repeat buyers in the market. And what we found is that there is, first of all, a very strong level of renewal activity. These are HRO buyers, typically, that have been in the market. They've outsourced in some sort of a Gen 1. And just because of the natural cycle of things, they're now approaching uh, a need to talk about a Gen 2 or a Gen 3 uh, type of a deal in the marketplace. They are as keenly interested in knowing what their technology roadmap to the future is as a new buyer. Um, the new buyers then make up slightly less than half. Um, and on the second, the middle section here, um, I found it interesting just to look at whether those pursuits and the way that folks are shopping in the market are competitive or sole sourced. And so what we see is, um, you know, most folks are either looking for technology or they're looking for the combined technology and services. And in the technology market, only in the center there, what we're seeing is an awful lot of technology bake-offs, right? Folks pitting Workday against Employee Central, against Fusion, and trying to figure out a path forward. And if you see a small dotted line there, or a small dotted extension to that technology-only line, um, what I'm representing there is there are a lot of these technology bake-offs that are happening either directly through the client procurement organization, client HR organizations, um, or um, really not crossing the advisory radar. We know that. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of activity out there. However, it doesn't appear that a lot of that activity and noise is resulting in consummated large buyer deals. And so I'll show you our experience with those that are advised and suggest that in some cases um, it's taking just as long or the same hurdles are being um, uh, encountered by HR or procurement buyers that are trying to solve some of these issues themselves. In the HRO space, uh, then, what we have are uh, a number of um, experienced buyers looking to renew. And in fact, in many cases where they're happy, um, they remain sole sourced. And, and really, those deals never go to market. So they never go to market from a services perspective. But that doesn't at all mean that they're not going to market from a technology perspective. So those renewal buyers that are remaining uh, sole sourced or happily sticking with their Aon Hewitts or their IBMs or their third party providers um, may not go to market, but they're still interested in the technology roadmap that will underlie those services. And so technology does come into play there. And on the far right, of course, if so much activity is really generated um, in the HRO space or in folks that are already in a combined model, how are those folks shopping for their technology or evaluating the SaaS um, to, to, to be or not to be SaaS question? And um, what we're finding is that buyers who are approaching uh, technology and services as a joint buying decision really are looking to the HRO provider, so the Aon Hewitts, the IBMs, the, the Xeroxes, the, um, the provider themselves to solution the underlying technology. And isn't that the way the HRO agreement was supposed to work in the first place, right? Um, the providers are supposed to be somewhat technology agnostic, and so the buyers are supposed to be able to go to the provider market and say, okay, provider, this is great. Now you tell me, do I stick with my old platform? Is it time to change? How do I evolve and kind of keep pace with the market? Um, where we do have, uh, I do have a small sliver where I want to clarify, HRO buyers that have client-dictated platforms, what I mean by that is, that the client themselves has decided, I need to move, or I have a compelling reason, and I want you to solution around Workday, or I want you to solution around the current technology because I just don't have the appetite to change and to manage change because I have other priorities um, in my organization at this time. Okay, let me present a little bit about what's happening in the technology-only buying space, and then I'll pause for a second in case folks have some questions. And so here, um, I actually think some of the results might surprise you. So this is technology only, where folks are shopping for an employee central versus a fusion versus a workday versus a current SAP platform. And they're really trying to figure out what technology am I going to use to support my workforce going forward. Um, and, and I think what's most amazing about this is um, that more activity than you would think, really the outcome is a punt, a delay. 
extending that decision to move to something new, and kind of letting the dust settle. Let's wait and see what's happening in the market. And so in the first two bullets, you'll see that most buyers are very motivated from a technology perspective. They're not on the newest, latest, greatest platform. They don't have, they, they would be in a situation where they might want to upgrade or change technologies to something new. And so 70, 68% of them are really pretty motivated to move into some type of a new platform. However, less than one third of the HR buyers, so 29% in our sample set, really chose to buy or upgrade their HR technology materially. And those that did really had a very compelling reason for doing so. So some of those reasons really largely were around our uh, legacy platform absolutely dying on, a, on its last breath and needs to be replaced. Or M&A or divestiture activities were forcing one of the companies to find something brand new and jump in and get something up and running. Um, or sometimes that extinct platform issue is really a vendor issue, right? So in an outsourced model, the vendor's platform is just not viable anymore. Um, but really it was taking a compelling reason to get buyers to jump and pull that trigger right now. The other thing that was very interesting about this is that those that were waiting to see, or those that were kind of extending their life of their platform, were choosing to articulate some sort of a roadmap to reevaluate and to relook and to try to position themselves into a SaaS or a future technology in some discrete short period of time. So two years was about the right time frame, and so many folks are punting um, and looking at this decision and saying, yeah, but I'm really not ready to pull the trigger or my business case isn't right or um, I have other priorities and I need to look at it, I expect to look at it, but not now. Okay. On the SaaS side of the house, so I think many of us have attributed Workday um, at least, uh, especially in the U.S. markets where, um, where there's really a lot of activity around the Workday platform with breathing some life back into HRO. Um, and it's happening right at a time when um, the HRO uh, clients, when HR itself has kind of ridden out its technology um, to, the, to the dying ends of its, of its capabilities. At the same time, SaaS is the disruptor, right? Um, so HR is surprisingly on the forefront of almost everything to do with the SaaS market. We've been using SaaS forever. We've been very comfortable with SaaS as a talent platform. We've used them in the sum totals and in the success factors and in the, you know, and, and so we actually are on the leading, bleeding edge of something in technology, which is just dumbfounding to me because um, that's not really our reputation, right? But we're there and we've been comfortable using SaaS and we've been SaaS consumers for a long time. Workday uh, began really US-centric and, uh, and mid-market, and so folks had been watching it, and, um, and it's begun to mature, and in fact, it's reached a great level of maturity on the US soils um, and among US headquartered global companies, so I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm in Europe and on European soil right now, and, uh, and so, um, so um, that ends up feeling a bit, you know, that's where it's headed in the U.S., and we expect some of that is trickling down into this side of the pond. But just so you get some sense for some of the things that are happening from U.S.-led um, activity, their client base has grown. Their client base has grown in three short years to over 500 clients. And those aren't just mid-sized clients. So they've kind of proven themselves as a large global core HR system. Um, and that's new. That's new, and that's um, within the last couple of years. You should know that they don't do their own implementations most of the time. So there's a whole discrete integrator market um, that comes along with that um, technology buy. And also that they're really truly inundated with requests. And so it generates a lot of activity and getting a workday to the level of seriousness and competitiveness that you might be interested in seeing them reach um, you know, is not going to happen until there's some major skin in the game, right? So there's a lot of sales activity, but getting that to a point where it's really truly um, uh, uh, competitive for them um, requires, requires uh, going quite far up the chain um, and, and proving your seriousness. We have Oracle Fusion and SAP Employee Central, and, um, you know, and they're catching up. 
they're catching up from a market share in SaaS, right, and uh, largely from a core platform perspective. Um, and, and really their focus after their talent acquisitions has been to figure out how am I going to integrate this great technology buy and this wonderful SaaS experience that I have and the client base that comes with it with the core part of HR that is employee data and ultimately the payroll interaction or the payroll processes. Um, at the same time, they're worried about their own life cycle of their existing ERP base, right? So how do I not kill my cash cow in the race to you know, bring my product over to the SAP life cycle? Um, there's an awful lot of experience with folks that can integrate um, your ERP platforms, but a lot of what's evolving in the SaaS space is HR core platforms is really um, not, doesn't have the discrete integration market and the discrete market of providers that hang out and implement these things for clients. So we have to look back to the ERP experience in order to find, uh, find an outlet for that transition. Um, what's, uh, what I think is the biggest phenomenon of all though is that you look at the screens, you look at the reports, you look at the dashboards and your HR practitioner says, this is what we've been trying to get to for the last, you know, for the last two years of implementing technology. And so it's a ground up swell of interest um, that is driving a lot of this activity. Um, and at some point in time that has to meet or not meet um, the executive buy decision. Okay. I just have one more piece on the, on the technology, the underlying technology itself, and then I just want to stop for a minute before I move into the HRO and how the services fits with the technology. Um, we've noticed in our deal and engagement experience in the market that on top of the disruption of SaaS and Workday on U.S. soils is kind of a uh, one-upping the disruptor activity that's going on in the market, right? So, um, so we have uh, some other players in the game that have very solid footing in the ERP uh, markets themselves um, that are now looking to make sure that they're appropriately positioned as SaaS kind of takes the world by storm. Um, and, and one of the um, interesting things that seems to be occurring of late anyways, I'll be interested to pull um, the group here is um, from an SAP perspective, SAP Employee Central in particular, we've begun to see uh, a, a noticeable release of communications, informal communications, around uh, little or no future investments directed toward the EC line, that the ERP line that's in place today and that um, those new product dollars would be directed toward the SaaS offering. And, um, and so, you know, try as I might to find a whole lot of formality around those messages. I'm not sure that I've seen any of it. I, I don't know if folks here have heard similar things or familiar with anything similar from, um, fr from the SAP Employee Central Front. Um, but that, that rumor or that, uh, that direction in product development is definitely out there, right? And what it's doing is it's starting to drive some of the consumer behavior. So HR buyers that are looking at technology are beginning to wonder, how long is my life cycle for EC6 if I'm, if I'm there? I'm current, but how long is that going to last, right? And am I going to get anything new and fresh out of this as I continue to work with that as a, as a current platform? And it's also causing a pretty strong incentive for the HRO providers who are solutioning and bringing those technologies to the table to say, wait a minute. What do I got to propose here as far as the system is concerned? Do I have to worry about proposing a current ERP platform and some current tools and services only to have a client worry that I'm going to deploy something that in two or three years before my contract's even over is irrelevant, right? Um, so I think some of that is, um, it, to me, is like, feels like disrupting the disruptor, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in this game, and I'm going to drive it, and I'm going to see where it'll go. Um, and so that's something that we're watching very carefully. The other thing that we're watching very carefully from a noise in the market perspective is kind of what the options are for payroll in the market. So we heard Norman say that payroll was a huge touch point, right? It's, it's something, a beast to be reckoned with and something to approach very carefully. And yet, um, the solutions in the SaaS market for payroll are limited. They're either limited by geography or they're limited by the fact that services don't come with the buy or they're limited by the fact that it's not really a SaaS model. So we see all of those variations. And in the midst of all of that, 
there is a positioning of providers um, that really want to orient themselves toward folks that are concerned primarily with making sure that the payroll engine doesn't stop and caretaking the broader payroll issue. So we do see providers like Northgate Orenso and ADP who have very broad, very strong footprints in the payroll space um, that, are, that are driven to pursue and get engaged and begin contacting um, and, and come into play, especially when multi-country payroll is one of the primary areas of focus for the client. We um, wanted to just make sure you know that Workday doesn't do payroll outside of North America. There's some rumors maybe the UK might be a module in the future. Um, otherwise, their approach is to be a connector or to provide connectors to global payroll providers um, or individual payroll providers. Um, but, but they certainly have aligned themselves with a number of providers that could do some bundled payroll. And, uh, and from the Oracle and SAP development on that front, I think Europe in particular, with the strength of SAP, should be watching to see how exactly are we going to watch SAP um, position success factors and its cloud payroll solution, uh, where they have a number of payroll templates that are developed in SAP, um, and yet uh, aren't necessarily deploying those in really a true SaaS model fashion. Um, they're still looking to deploy those in single tenant country models. So, so the way that that's deployed isn't, um, isn't exactly uh, in line with the SaaS positioning that you might be doing from a technology perspective. Um, okay, so I want to pause because my next section will shift to what happens when um, we start to look at, uh, at, at both ends of the spectrum. Actually, I'm lying. I'm going to cover one more slide here first and then ask, and ask for questions before I move on. Um, we've seen, and we see even in the HRO today, structure of the tracks um, and the sessions and our areas of interest, kind of a bifurcation in perspective and how clients are approaching the issues that they have to solve in HR. And so I have kind of two distinct areas of focus that occur and are addressed in the organization. And, and two distinct kind of um, mindsets and solutions to solve. On the one hand, you have folks that are focused on talent and performance. And on the other hand, you have folks that have more of a focus on core HR, right? And so folks uh, that are focused on talent and solving talent issues oftentimes are looking to optimize workforce performance, right? They're looking at SAS, uh, mature, mature SaaS models and, and greatening the integration um, that's happening in the marketplace already. They're looking at kind of bringing in, learning, recruiting, focusing on top talent, getting into predictive analytics, right? This leads them down a path as they try to solve some of those issues. Um, that path is littered with a lot of pretty mature SaaS offerings, like the Success Factors base or the Teleo base, and, and broadening those cornerstone is another in the area. And it also oftentimes causes um, those activities to focus on the salaried workforce or top talent or a portion of the workforce. Um, that they're particularly interested in developing and maintaining. On the other side of the house, we have the core HR perspective. And from the core HR perspective, we see folks focusing more on global employee headcount and core master data, how that's going to touch payroll and how those two things are going to interact. And, uh, and those folks tend to explore more the Workday SaaS model, how the ERP upgrades are progressing to handle a global rollout of talent, what's happening with Fusion, how are we going to touch all of our countries for that payroll integration, right? And they're, so they're solving a broad employee data pay time concerns. Um, the business cases are different, right? Your talent business case is more about kind of your return on talent and some of your softer um, values to the organization. And yet in core HR, we still have business cases that are focused on trying to drive out some of that outsourced administration activity and drive down costs. What's important about these two different perspectives in the market and in our buyers is they don't necessarily lead you neatly to the same place on the roadmap. And so as folks, talent, as folks uh, lean on talent and develop their organization from a talent perspective, they're making choices and deploying items that lead them in certain, in certain directions or in certain paths to get the most out of the talent and the performance of the organization. And as folks focus on the core HR, they might make completely different choices from a technology and a services perspective to solve those issues. And what happens and where those roads meet in the middle is not a neat and clean place. And so many of us are charged with 
movement on one side of that spectrum or the other. And it's important to be aware of the fact that it just, the roads don't neatly align to the right place. And so it is important to have a bit broader perspective on how or where you might eventually meet along the road. Let me pause because I flipped through a number of slides and materials that we'll make available to you. If we're focused on kind of the SAS, the technology bake off, the work days, the employee centrals, the, does anyone have any comments to share, any questions, any particular direction or angle they'd be interested to talk about? Otherwise, I'm not shy. I'll just keep going. <laughs> It's a very uh, recognizable setting of the scene. Uh, when you talked about the rumors of SAP disinvesting in uh, their core, rumors, uh, okay. informal, but it's, uh, it's all very recognizable what you're uh, describing here. Great. Yeah. Then how do you navigate out of that, right? So that's yeah, the that's, big challenge the question, for all yeah. of us, no matter what I see this, we this chasm. I see this also, the, the schisma between the, the talent and the, and the core HR. So yeah. it's, uh, it's very nicely put, to, put together so far. Right. You'll, you'll have access to anybody who wants a direct send. Just pass me your card at the end. Okay, let's talk about how the HRO providers fit with this. So there are a number of buyers, and we all um, have long been associated with or newly associated with the HRO Today Forum, so have some interest and some perspective in outsourcing um, of these activities. And a great many buyers are interested in technology and services together, solving that nut together in a, in a sourced market. Um, and so we looked at uh, the technology and services buyers that were out there to see what was happening with that activity. And what we've been able to identify is that, first of all, um, a lar the large HR buyers, those who are dealing with a material population, I'll mention that is maybe 10,000 and above or 7,500 and above types of populations, a majority of those are looking to outsource technology and services. And that does include a struggle, an initial struggle up front to say, what do I do? Do I go to market for HRO? Do I go to market for technology and then go to market for services? Do I choose my HRO and then do some bake off of technology within that? And how do I sequence those decisions as an HR buyer? Most of the market uh, is looking to the HRO buyers where they're interested in both to bring forward that solution. Um, the other important thing I think about that is that when you have buyers, we have a vast majority of buyers who are in a model, are not looking to leave that outsourced model, right? So we're, while there are plenty of problems and lots of scope alignments and maybe some tweaking and, and movement around, buyers that have gotten themselves into an HR outsourced administration model um, are not bailing ship moving to a workday and bringing everything back in-house. Um, that, that's not what's been happening in the market. No buyers, in fact, even when they did make the change to a new technology, had left the outsourced model um, in the material way, other than just tweaking, tweaking some of their scope. And out of all five clients who were dissatisfied with their current HRO provider, they all either switched, four of them switched, and one of them, when presented with the cost of switching, just wasn't that that's dissatisfied in the first place, I guess. And they continued to, to walk that path with their provider. Um, but the HRO providers, really, this is their business, their core bread and butter. And so what I think is important to recognize is that they are the ones that are quickly productizing services around these new technologies because they know that the clients want these in their environment. They want evergreen. They want new releases and upgrades without these big fat capital burdens, right? And yet it's incumbent on them to be able to provide the rest of the services that fill that gap. And so they, uh, as much as anyone else in the market, really are, um, are working on making that gap fill and uh, productizing that so that it can be brought to the market um, much more quickly. Um, I think my, on the bottom of the slide there I just mentioned, where we see folks that are technology buyers first, once they get themselves into a workday um, type of a situation or a new SaaS tool that's supposed to be painfully easy for all of your managers and your employees to just pick up and use, right? Once they get into that model, the natural question that follows is, what do I do to organize the shared services around that model. 
So I've deployed some tool, it's wonderful, but it's not the be all end all, and I do have opportunities from a shared services perspective to figure out how do I deliver the services that complement this great technology, right? And so we do find that we're doing a lot more activity around clients who have made a technology choice and then been interested in what do I do for shared services? And that answer gets infinitely more complex when you start to talk about a region like Europe or a global client where you have multiple countries, multiple languages, multiple local influences, and all of a sudden the, um, the very confident US-based client who wants to do their own shared services thing is an awful lot less confident about being able to deliver with any scale and efficiency. Okay. I, I answer a lot of questions about why do I care about the service delivery if I have this great new technology, right? So it's intuitive, it's got dashboards, it, you know, it walks itself, it feeds itself, it talks itself, it does all these cool things. Why would I care about a services model on top of that? What we're finding is that, um, that folks do care and that the markets are responding with clients like Ann Hewitt, uh, Motorola is one of the three clients live today in a BPO SaaS model. They have five or six more that are coming, uh, have been announced, others are following. But what the clients are demanding, and especially those clients who have had it, even in a broken, maybe old fashioned, 10 year old technology fashion, is that they're accustomed to having a seamless user experience. And the pure technology underneath, that raw SaaS technology, delivers some user experience, but it doesn't connect all the dots. And a lot of those dots have been connected historically through some of the proprietary offerings of our HRO friends. Whether it's their portal or their, their tools in the back office to manage cases and track cases. And, and so these are the items that we see most missing or absent, kind of the gaps to fill. Um, for folks that find themselves buying the latest, greatest technology and feeling very good about where they're getting from a technology package perspective and still feeling like there isn't anything to bundle together the experience. That's case management, that's email, that's chat inquiries and knowing who's contacted from what channels and kind of keeping those all in alignment with each other. It's access to policies and procedures online. Um, both for folks in a service center and for your employees and managers. It's integrating things that are in the package native themselves. So if you go to a cornerstone or you're using a, a benefits, payroll, learning systems that aren't in your package, those aren't nat natively integrated in these SaaS tool suites. And so there's nothing kind of pulling that experience together. Folks do still need to do back office administration where everything just doesn't happen naturally or make magically by itself in the self-service environment. We have a lot of employees in different situations that don't even have access to self-service technologies. And so there's a certain amount of data entry or mechanism for changing data and making updates when they can't just flow through self-service. Um, and then the reports and analytics, which some are native certainly to the tool, but we do see a big upsurge in big data conversations and how we're gonna mine and predict um, using data and tools, that's out there, and it's out there for a reason. It's still a need. Um, finally, those who have already outsourced payroll, so if you're a buyer looking at SaaS, and you like what you see, um, buying a SaaS tool or module does not solve the services support that you may have, want, or need for payroll. And so a tool is great, and a SaaS module is great, and templates for multiple countries are great, but very few clients we see are really willing to repatriate payroll and bring back in and hire payroll administration support where they may already have an outsourced solution for that. There's very little appetite to do that. And so these modules don't fix or don't solve that. A lot of the demand that we see in the market are folks trying to fill gaps, right? So they're marching in multiple directions. We're all trying to achieve something tangible in HR, and it's leaving a number of gaps out there, whether it's I've bought a system and now I recognize I need an integrator because you know, they don't implement their own system. I've got a shared services center. I bought a cool system. How the heck do I uh, provide a portal? You know, I need a portal. How do I fill the portal gap? I need um, to figure out how to change the organization and move into a COE um, type of a model. 
the HROs themselves are reeling, really trying to thin down their portals and, and put themselves in a space to be able to deliver appropriately on top of SaaS. And the payroll gaps are, are an issue to be reckoned with. And so there's a lot of providers floating around in this soup um, that are systems providers. And there's a lot of providers floating around in the soup that are services providers. And what it's doing is it's creating not only a heightened level of activity, but a lot of confusion on the part of HR buyers on how to see themselves through to a roadmap that makes sense when you put it all together at the end. So the, some of the last items that I wanted to highlight before we go into any discussion in any way, shape, or form that you might want to talk about the SaaS and HRO markets as they're evolving or what the experiences might be is every buyer situation is so unique. It's very, very unique. Not only is the buying perspective unique, here's what I think I need or I think I want, um, but their situation is unique. And so it's very important to be able to look through and carefully think a roadmap, not only for that buying decision that they're trying to make, but also a little bit more broadly to how this is going to fit once you step back and take a broader perspective at your HR delivery in your organization. Um, from this study, I will tell you that the things that most influence how the HR buyers are approaching the market, what they're trying to solve for, what they think they need and what they're doing are twofold. First of all, it's their existing HR payroll and talent platforms. What do you have in your house today to leverage? And where is that in its own native life cycle? A huge impact. Somebody that is a SAP shop and has been SAP and thinks SAP and their finances are SAP has a natural inclination to want to look at how do I continue to leverage this broad capital investment in my organization. Somebody that is enamored with their success factors and absolutely ecstatic that they can roll out recruiting and talent and learning and bring all of these together um, in a more integrated fashion for real workforce performance is happily down that path and they're not as concerned right now about how they're going to do hourly employee master data changes for a broader population. It's not their sole area of focus. The other single biggest influencer is whether or not they currently outsource HR administration and or payroll administration. These are huge um, touch points in their delivery model today that impact how they approach buying and what they want to buy in the market. And a big part of that is very simple. I have this taken care of today. Whatever I do, I'm not looking to lose it or to go backwards from this. I want to make things better and to move forward. And so it means that it tells you a lot, a lot of nuts that need to be solved for in order to move that buyer to a new space. Capital investment in HR has been the bane of our existence forever, right? I mean, we're not the guys that the company dumps their additional cash for the year to and says, here, do something neat and cool with this. It's very tough for us to get capital funding for any of the initiatives that we're trying to pursue in HR. And so what's interesting about some of the market activity is um, you need to plan for the fact that these products and services are evolving. And you might be solving for a particular path of activity or needs, but this is not your only tip drink at the well. And becoming very comfortable with and articulating solid business cases will make or break any movement or activity in um, an HR buying decision. And I think finally, when it comes to contracting SaaS, um, a lot of organizations that we work with end up having a very misdirected comfort level here. It's a technology buy, right? And so that makes procurement very comfortable with it. It makes, um, it makes payroll, folks who have sourced payroll forever, very comfortable trying to pick up the payroll um, portion of a deal. It makes somebody who's just renewing an HRO model for another generation very comfortable in saying, I'm contracting, my, my, uh, I have enough expertise in house to kind of get through this. And the important lesson that we see our clients learning is contracting SaaS, or even trying to build a roadmap for services and solutions that will incorporate SaaS at some point in the future is really a very different animal. And there are a few things that make it very different. There's not a lot of information widely available about where you can get and what you can achieve 
in your SaaS deal. Right? There's a lot of information available about this is the way the pricing structure is in SaaS. This is the way the policies you know, and, and the, and the um, data security activities work in SaaS. There's not a lot, you're left to believe that there's not a lot you can do about many aspects of a SaaS deal that you might sign. And there's an awful lot of folks to engage in the organization to make sure that a SaaS model is comfortable for your company. Um, and so involving folks outside of HR broadly is a big challenge. And uh, oftentimes the buying decisions are not led by broad-based teams uh, that, are, that, are, that have that level of activity. And getting any insight or information about has anyone ever made progress negotiating this dimension before is very elusive. And it requires, um, it requires either a lot of networking with peers or it requires seeking out some assistance with folks who um, have some experience with has anybody ever made progress here? Can you make progress here? Um, what could I possibly do as I try to approach this contract? And many buyers are so happy and so anxious to get into their next solution and move things forward on the transformation needle that there isn't near enough care and attention paid um, to what they need to do to set their current contract in the best position possible. I don't think I have uh, much more other than to open it up and see what's on your minds and um, where you're at in your own journey to look at the future possibilities, what challenges you have today, how any of this might be helpful or interesting or what other perspectives maybe I should have included that I didn't. In the uh, BBC, what do you see in the marketplace in terms of um, second generation HR, do you see people starting to think about items that are coming back in-house? Um, what's your insight in that? And the second part, <clears throat> sorry, is in terms of bundling products together, what do you see is happening in the marketplace at the moment? We normally see that HR is run by HR, payroll is run by payroll, but actually what's the bigger benefit in terms of a bundle um, to a, uh, a prospective buyer? Okay. Let me start first of all with your question about second generation HR folks. Um, folks that are procuring their second generation are oftentimes uh, adjusting or tweaking or right sizing a scope that was quite ambitious in the early years of HR outsourcing, right? If that hadn't happened, fallen off, or corrected itself across the continuum of the life of the contract, this is the opportunity to right size those scope issues today. We are not seeing wholesale repatriation. Um, we are seeing switching where um, there's dissatisfaction and most switching is due to, um, you know, we, we have a small number of tier one providers that have been successful and continue to gain business and have investment to leverage and develop and bring new products. We have a number of other um, tier two or tier three HRO providers whose um, investments and new dollars has become quite stagnant. And so most often the switching is someone who is in an HRO relationship from a provider that isn't earning or gaining a lot of new business and, and keeping fresh, fresh investment coming in. Um, so that, that's what we're seeing there. When it comes to bundling, there are a couple of touch points that are making sense to bundle. So there's a very tight relationship between workforce administration and payroll. In many cases, those lines are very blurred depending on which systems or resources are doing which activities. So there's a very tight relationship there. That doesn't necessarily equate to needing to keep all of that in scope, right? It just means needing to think that through very carefully. And most often what we're seeing is very large populations um, have stuck with or continued to maintain the same technology and provider solutions as the core HR, global mother solution. And beyond the threshold of the largest of the large, um, then it becomes an exercise in thoughtfulness and making sure that it all fits together right. Um, talent is defining itself as something that can be pieced in and integrated. It's more important maybe to integrate in and among its own modules and components and then feel, figure out how to fit that in with the core. And when it comes to benefits um, and some of the other ancillary areas, what we're seeing is there's no longer as much thought about um, global buying power or leverage to drive pricing down by simply putting in more 
activities, right? So in the US where benefits administration is hairy, used to be you would bundle all of those things together. In second generation contracts now, as those come to market, it's more advantageous to the buyers to look at the benefits market separately from the HRO market because there are, there are providers that have emerged that have that specialized strength. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? In the middle of unique challenges, bumps along the road, wondering why they would ever want to go this way. <laughs> Hello, Andy Spence. Um, I don't know whether you saw the panel discussion yesterday uh, with some buyers and Mike Etling from uh, Northgate Rinso HR. Yeah, I didn't see. I actually ducked out right in between, so I missed. I was at the one before, and I missed that. Um, no, so, so I the didn't reason see I mention it is um, one of the summaries from that on the impact of SaaS on the HRO market was, you know, the summary was H multi process HRO is dead. And that's been driven by some of the improvements in the software due to SaaS. So the size of the pie is reducing. So my, my question really is, do, do you agree with that? Or are you seeing any trends in the size of the deals in HRO? Yeah, so I would say um, you're not a horses for sources guy, are you? No. <laughs> OK, there was, also, there was also a large article out by Horses for Sources that had some similar, had some similar perspective they were sharing about, is really the HRO market um, dead? I would say we're seeing the opposite. So what we're seeing is, now, I don't mean to say that we're seeing this great huge rush, right? It's not the gold rush and folks are going, oh my god, get me into an outsource model now, right? We've still been hovering around the 15 to 20% of the large market as far as penetration goes in HRO. We have seen more new buyer activity in these last eight months than we've seen in the pre previous three or four years. Some of that is general market conditions, right, and the availability of capital. But we've had more new buyers now to the market than we've had in prior years combined. We're also seeing in the renewals, and there's been a tremendous amount of renewal activity, we are not seeing an exodus even where clients are moving into a SaaS model and presumably would contemplate um, doing those things themselves. And so we're seeing buyers who are in that model happy with that model and recognizing the value of the gaps that are filled by the HRO's proprietary activity. The third thing that we're seeing is buyers that are focused on technology buys, and so if HRO has 15 to 20%, that leaves 80% of the market, right, that's never gotten into a broad outsourced um, type of a model. So those buyers are in a better situation to jump into a new technology, right, to be able to say, I never got much very far in the first place, this is a fresh new opportunity for me. Those buyers are not racing necessarily into an HRO delivery model. They are looking to move into something that is a future technology, and then they're turning around and saying, wait a minute, I need to fix some gaps. And some of those gaps are focused around the back office administration, the portal technology, you know, all these things that I need to either solve myself or I need to step back and say, what can the market do for me? And am I looking for tools that will build a portal for myself, or do I need to stop and say, well, I also have a buy decision here. I can move my model with my neat new technology into an outsourced market model. And so that's the progression that we're seeing more than any. The challenge is the HRO market is not yet ready to be able to handle that in mass. So the HRO market now has legs under it for the workday tool they don't have the same legs under it for Employee Central and for Fusion. They don't. The market demand has not led them there. It's leading them there, but it has not led them there. We are also seeing um, buyer size shrink. So before outsourcing was for your 10,000 plus live companies, right? We're now seeing that market size creep down to 8,000, 7,000. And we're seeing models built around SaaS by the HRO providers that are specifically looking at how do I make this palatable at a smaller market size? Um, but I would tell you it's gradual, it's slow, but we definitely don't see the death of the market. We see a lot of demand. Mm 